So in our last video, we talked about preoperative cardiac risk assessment. And in this video, we're going to be talking about mainly hepatic risk assessment and adrenal insufficiency, which are going to be very common topics that you're going to come across, as well as some other miscellaneous topics as well. So let's get started right into it. So for hepatic risk, we are really talking about patients with cirrhosis. And there are a lot of things that we need to get optimized before patients with cirrhosis go to surgery. One of the things that we check usually is that if they are outpatient, we're actually going to check the MELD score. And if the MELD score is less than 10, then the patient can proceed to surgery. If it's between 10 and 15, they can proceed to surgery, but you would probably want to try and optimize them a little bit more. And if their MELD score is greater than 15, they, they should not proceed to surgery. On the inpatient side, we're really going to be looking at two scores. Uh, and the first one is going to be the Mayo score, which kind of predicts post-operative complications uh, and mortality uh, with cirrhosis. And then more recently, there is this new vocal pen score. Both of these risk calculators are going to give you a good estimate of how high of a risk somebody is going to be when they go to surgery. Uh, but recently, this vocal pen score may be really kind of uh, taking the forefront and potentially superseding the Mayo risk score. Uh, you can see in these graphs, this kind of uh, dotted line right here is the observed amount of mortality after surgery. And then the predicted line is illustrated by these different colors here. And as you can tell, the Mayo risk score is in this area right here. And you can see it's significantly overpredicted mortality, whereas the vocal pen score was actually very closely correlated with the observed amount of mortality. So just taking a quick look at these scores on MDCalc, you can see the MELD score, which is again what we're going to use for outpatient assessment. And these are some of the criteria that we use here. And then the Mayo score is found here. You can see that the criteria include the age, ASA score, Billy Rubin, creatinine, INR, and etiology of cirrhosis. And the key thing to note here is that anybody with compensated cirrhosis uh, will have an ASA score of three, and any signs of decompensated cirrhosis, even if it's just like mild ascites or hepatic encephalopathy, uh, should be coded as a ASA of four, because they're going to have elevated risk going to surgery. And finally, we have this newer vocal pen score. And it, again, it's going to tell you the 30-day mortality, the 90-day mortality, 180-day mortality. And here's some of the scores here. Again, ASA score, Compensated cirrhosis is going to be three, and then decompensated cirrhosis is going to be four. So in general, I would probably calculate both the Mayo score and the vocal pen score, so you just have a good assessment. But as I mentioned earlier, vocal pen score may be becoming more popular in the future. All right, so once you've calculated all those risk scores, then you're going to need to optimize the patient. And so what are a lot of the common complications that we can see in patients with cirrhosis? So number one, and probably the most common one that you're going to be dealing with, ascites. You can have hepatic encephalopathy, altered hemostasis, varices. And then finally, altered pharmacology. So starting with ascites, any ascites prior to surgery is going to be an increased risk factor for mortality. It's going to increase wound dehiscence because obviously if a patient's really distended in terms of their abdomen, then it's going to make it harder for the, he the wounds to heal. So really the big treatment here is going to be diuretics versus paracentesis prior to surgery. For hepatic encephalopathy, this is also going to be an independent risk factor for increased mortality. It's going to occur in about 7 to 10% of patients in the post-op period. If they're having hepatic encephalopathy beforehand, then obviously you want to give lactulose, also plus or minus rifaximin. And then one interesting thing to note is that it may be relatively contraindicated to use lactulose in intra-abdominal surgeries uh, because lactulose can be flammable. So if they're going to be using bovies for electrocautery, this actually may be something that you want to avoid the days before the surgery because you don't want them to be doing some kind of surgery and then causing a fire in the OR. <laughs> Obviously, patients with cirrhosis are going to have altered hemostasis. They're going to have both increased risk of bleeding and clotting. And the reason that you have this is because they're going to have thrombocytopenia because they have reduced thrombopoietin. You also get uh, splenic sequestration of platelets. And then also you have decreased factor production of all the factors that are made in the liver, like C, S, 2, 7, 9, and 10. All those are going to contribute to both a hypercoagulable state, but also a increased bleeding hypocoagulable state as well. And so uh, really one of the things that we can recommend prior to surgery is that some of these patients may be a good candidate to get this TEG scan or a thromboelastogram, which basically is a very special test that can measure specifically which parts of the clotting cascade are not working properly and can guide, you know, which products you should um, replace in the patients with cirrhosis. Varices are going to obviously uh, introduce an increased risk of very significant bleeding. And so we have to be very careful in these situations. And what you're going to recommend to the surgical teams is to really be judicious 
with uh, fluids in the operating room. So if they can avoid giving too many fluids and uh, avoid elevating the central venous pressure as much, uh, that would be ideal. So they should really be a little bit more conservative with how many fluids they're giving. If it's a long time out from surgery, then you can consider uh, initiating a beta blocker prior to surgery, uh, trying to basically decrease the risk of a variceal bleed. And then finally, altered pharmacology. So a lot of drugs are going to be metabolized by the liver. And so if you have a dysfunctional liver, you're going to have different uh, pharmacologies that may lead to longer half-lives, more buildup of toxins in the uh, body. And the key thing here is to be cautious with using too many benzos and opioids. And then one last point that I wanted to mention is that if a patient is having refractory ascites or refractory varices, one thing you can do is consider a TIPS procedure to reduce that uh, portal hypertension. Uh, but be aware that this is going to take some time, obviously, so it's only going to be for like an elective surgery, and it is going to increase the risk of hepatic encephalopathy. All right, so that's going to be your hepatic risk assessment. So if they're outpatient, check that MELD score. Inpatient, check the Mayo and vocal pen score. And then based on what comorbidities they have, then try and optimize them with that diuretics or lactulose or whatever before surgery. All right, guys, let's move on to talking about adrenal insufficiency because a lot of the patients that are coming in may be on some chronic prednisone at home. And so what are you going to do about that? Do these patients need stressed steroids? Do you need to test their HPA axis? What do you do if somebody's taking prednisone every day at home? So in terms of the structure that I go through, if the patient is taking five milligrams or less of prednisone, then you don't have to do anything. They can proceed to surgery and just continue their current dose. And if they're taking greater than 20 milligrams, for at least three weeks. And the way you can remember this is uh, 20 milligrams for greater than 20 days, then they should just get empirically treated with stress dose steroids during their surgery. The way that you do that depends on how big of a stressor the surgery is. So if it's a low stress surgery, then you can actually just continue their home dose. So this would be like a cataract uh, repair or hernia repair. For a moderate stress surgery, such as a cholecystectomy or a joint replacement, then you can do 50 milligrams IV hydrocortisone before their surgery, and then you do 25 Q8 for the next 24 hours, and then go back to home dose after that. And then finally, if they're undergoing a high stress surgery, for example, a complex vascular surgery or a spine surgery, then you can give them 100 milligrams IV. Then you can do 50 Q8 for 24 hours, 25 Q8 for the next 24 hours, and then resume home dose after that. Okay, but what about this middle ground where the patient is taking between 5 and 20 milligrams of prednisone daily? In this case, we are going to do uh, stress testing or basically testing their HPA axis. And the first thing you're going to start with is a serum AM cortisol. So if the serum AM cortisol is less than 5, then they are uh, adrenally suppressed. And so you can go straight to doing the stress dose steroids that we talked about over here. If the serum AM cortisol is greater than 10, then they are not adrenally uh, suppressed, so they can just continue their home dose. But if their serum AM cortisol is between 5 and 10, then this test is kind of indeterminate, and we're going to have to do further testing with ACTH stimulation testing, or also known as cosyntropin stimulation test. The way that this test works is that you give them cosyntropin, which is basically an analog of ACTH, and then you recheck their cortisol levels 30 minutes and then an hour after you give the cosyntropin. And what we're looking for in this case is if their cortisol is greater than 18, then they are not adrenally suppressed and they're responding to ACTH uh, just fine. So they can just continue their home dose. If their cortisol is less than 18, then you should do stress dose steroids. And again, you would go over to this algorithm over here. If the patient at any point has to go to urgent surgery, then just empirically do stress dose steroids. This is mainly because you don't have time to do all the HPA axis testing. And so you might as well just empirically give them some stress dose steroids and the patient should do fine after that. All right, so just a quick recap. If they're taking less than five milligrams, they can just continue their home dose. Greater than 20 milligrams for more than three weeks, do stress dose steroids. If they're between five to 20, then you're gonna have to do HPA axis testing. First, you start with the serum AM cortisol. If it's less than five, you can just empirically treat. Greater than 10, then you can just give them their home dose. If it's indeterminate, then check the ACTH stimulation test. And if it's greater than 18, just continue their home dose. If it's less than 18, then give them stress dose steroids. 
All right, so now I'm just going to go over some miscellaneous topics. So we got pulmonary risk, delirium risk, hypothyroidism, hyperthyroidism, and rheumatoid arthritis. And the key points here is that many patients uh, are going to be going into surgery with some kind of pre-existing lung disease, and we really have to optimize them. You need to make sure they're not having like an active COPD or asthma exacerbation before they go to surgery. And if they are, obviously give them uh, duonebs, treat them, make sure they're not in an exacerbation prior to surgery. The key points here is that routine check sex rays are not indicated, but sometimes we do get them. Uh, routine PFTs are also not indicated except for kind of lung volume reduction surgeries, uh, intrathoracic surgeries, uh, or if there's any patient with COPD or asthma and you're not sure if they're at their best ba baseline or not. And then our biggest thing is post-surgically, you should make sure all patients are doing incentive spirometry and that they are encouraged to have early uh, mobilization, which will really help expand their lung volumes. It's very common that you're going to get consulted postoperatively for post-op hypoxemia. So in those cases, check volume status, uh, check for any signs of DVT or PE, which is, again, is a um, high risk after a surgery as well. So for delirium, uh, this is also very common after surgery and, again, increases the risk of mortality if a patient is having a delirium afterwards. This is going to be very common in a lot of those geriatric hip fracture patients that have baseline dementia. And so we really need to optimize everything to reduce the risk of delirium. So this is uh, often accomplished by a delirium order set if your hospital has one. And these usually includes like decreased vital sign checks overnight so they can get more restful sleep, uh, bed by the window. We also like to give patients their hearing aids and their um, glasses. Uh, avoid benzos and opioids as much as possible because, again, that's going to increase the risk of delirium. Uh, remove foleys and other lines as quickly as possible. And encourage family to be at bedside to reorient the patient. Hypothyroidism is obviously going to cause many different uh, side effects. Uh, a big one is going to be increased constipation, uh, but also an overall decreased metabolic rate, decreased wound healing, things like that. And so if somebody has subclinical hypothyroidism, uh, then you can really just proceed to surgery. If they have mild, then you can again proceed, but you can treat with uh, levothyroxine. And then if it's severe, then if it's elective, then you can uh, delay it until they're euthyroid. If it's urgent, or emergent, just give them IV, uh, T3, and T4, and then proceed to surgery. For hyperthyroidism, obviously you have increased risk of arrhythmias, also increased risk of uh, precipitating thyroid storm, which has a mortality rate of up to 40%. So this is something we definitely uh, need to avoid. So just like with hypothyroidism, if it is elective, we're going to delay until they're euthyroid. So just like with hypothyroidism, if they're subclinical, then they can proceed to surgery. If it's overt, then we're gonna have to see how urgent the surgery is. So if it is elective, then we are going to delay until they are euthyroid. If it is urgent, then we are going to need to proceed to surgery because it's an urgent surgery, but we want to avoid um, thyroid storm. So you're going to start a beta blocker plus a thionidamide, which is usually like methimazole. Apparently, you're also supposed to give potassium iodide solution, and I would probably consult endocrinology in this case. And finally, one last point, if any patient is coming in with rheumatoid arthritis, then what you need to do before surgery is get uh, flexion and extension neck films. And this is because there is an increased risk of atlantoaxial subluxation. And so this is something that will be very useful for uh, the anesthesiologists to know because they want to know when they're intubating somebody how far they can really extend the person's neck. And so we want to get these before intubation so that we know how safely it is going to be in terms of intubating this patient. And then just some quick notes. So uh, in the outpatient setting, you're going to be asked, is it indicated to get you know baseline hemoglobin, electrolytes, EKG, chest x-ray, PFTs? So as we already kind of talked about, baseline PFTs and chest x-rays are not usually indicated. If the patient is undergoing a uh, low-risk procedure, uh, then they don't need uh, a baseline EKG. So if they're going for a cataract surgery, uh, then you don't necessarily need an EKG. Baseline electrolytes are not really indicated, um, but typically since the patients are often going to be getting a CBC anyways, we will pursue getting uh, just some electrolytes as a baseline. And then hemoglobin is recommended in any patients greater than 65 or in any patients greater than age 50 who have an increased risk for uh, having bleeding or if they have a high risk procedure. In terms of getting a baseline echo, we covered that in the previous video, which was the uh, cardiac pre-risk assessment video. And that about covers it for this topic. So we went through hepatic risk assessment, 
management, adrenal insufficiency, and then all of these uh, miscellaneous topics such as pulmonary, delirium, uh, thyroid, and also rheumatoid arthritis. I hope you guys learned something and that this helped you in your path to uh, being a star at perioperative uh, management. And thanks again for watching. I'll see you in the next video and peace. Yeah,